So what I want to do this morning is I want to talk very specifically about what we call adaptive stewardship. So my, um, my partners and I in the Soil Health Academy, you know, this is one of the core things that we teach. You know, we talk about regenerative practices, regenerative agriculture, rebuilding and restoring our ecosystems, but underneath that is the ability to be able to properly steward everything that we have been blessed and charged with. And as farmers and ranchers, we control the vast majority of the land that exists here, not just in the U.S., but globally. And therefore, our responsibility runs very deep, very deep. Okay. Oh, I got to turn it on. That would help. There we go. So I want to start by telling you a little bit about what we do. Now, uh, my partners in Soil Health Academy, uh, all of you know who they are. It's Gabe Brown, Ray Archuleta, Dave Brandt. Uh, we formed that about two years ago. And uh, I, I do have to say that, that that is going extremely well. Uh, we're teaching quite a few academies across U.S., Canada, Mexico, and have been invited to many other countries to put on academies as well. So, so there is an interest. There, there's a large interest in being able to educate and help people move in this direction. But in terms of what I do outside of my partnership with those guys in the academy, we have a meat and poultry company. It's called Joyce Farms. And we produce and market pastured proteins basically from Boston down to Miami and as far west as St. Louis. And our predominant market that we target, and this is very important, many of you in here today either have already developed some markets or you're thinking about it, and I even had some conversations about this last night, but one of the things that we do as farmers and ranchers is Many times we, we don't know what we need to know about marketing and being able to actually sell our products in an efficient and effective and profitable manner. So that's one of the things that, one of our core principles, and, and you always have to have a specific market focus when you are marketing, and again, ours is restaurants. So we do a lot of ranching to produce these pastured proteins and a lot of grass finishing. And we produce a very high quality grass fed beef. Uh, we harvest 52 weeks out of the year every week in load lots. And every week of the year, all of our product is USDA federally graded. And every week, 52 weeks out of the year, we are now able to average 85% and up USDA choice and prime grass fed beef. And what you see on the slides here in the pictures is an example of that beef. You absolutely cannot tell it from, you know, a highly marbled feedlot finished product in that regard. We also do a lot of pastured pork production. Uh, in any given day, we'll have about 3,000 or so hogs out on pasture. And just like we move our cattle very frequently, our pigs are moved daily as well under single strand poly wire. So they are very well trained to the poly wire, to the electricity. Pigs love to forage. They, it, it is something that, that they just absolutely are thrilled with. And every day when we turn them into new paddocks, they're just jumping and squealing with delight, all of that, just moving into those new paddocks. And, and we plant very complex annual mixes in a lot of our fields for these pigs. And what we find is that when they're moved every day, then you have very little rooting, very little destruction. They're not interested in doing that. We also do pastured lamb, pastured sheep. We use uh, hair sheep down where we are. That works very well. We also produce and market grass-fed bison. Our bison, by the way, are managed the same way that we manage all the other species of livestock. They are trained to a single strand of poly wire and trained to daily movement. 
So I've been told many, many times that you can't do that with bison, but absolutely you can. And, and we are doing that very effectively and very efficiently. We also do a lot of poultry production. So we produce pastured eggs. And, uh, you know, we have different structures. On this slide, you see a hoop house structure. But we also take advantage of materials that we have that are fairly cheap. Does anybody recognize what that is there? What did that used to be? It's now a poultry caravan, but what did it used to be? It was a cotton wagon, exactly, a cotton wagon. You know, and nobody uses these down south anymore, right? You know, because everybody's gone to modules and bailers, and so these cotton wagons have become, become obsolete. We can pick them up for a couple of hundred bucks a piece and turn them into an excellent poultry caravan. And that particular wagon there can house five to 600 birds. So it's a very cheap way, and we can build them out, buy them for 200 and build them out for around 1,000 to 1,200 total cash in them. Not bad at all. We also produce a lot of pastured poultry. We do uh, pastured chickens, heritage Spanish black turkeys, guineas, pheasant, duck, and those types of things, and market those to our restaurants. Last year, we sold 40,000 Spanish black turkeys for an average of $100 a piece, okay? So now that's when, now think about that, think about that. You can go to any grocery store, anywhere around Thanksgiving and buy a frozen turkey for what? 30 to 40 cents a pound, right? And we sold 40,000 heritage turkeys at an average of $100 a piece. So don't tell me that the consumer only wants to buy just cheap food. That is absolutely not true. But we have had that ingrained in our minds as farmers and ranchers that everything has to be cheap. They will pay for true verifiable value. They absolutely will. We have our own USDA poultry processing plant because with the numbers that we harvest, you know, your big vertical integrators, they're not going to welcome us into their plants. You know, Tyson or Sanderson Farms, anybody like that, they're not going to slaughter our poultry for us. So we had to build our own plant, and so we do poultry processing at scale. But what we have done within that plant, we also do all of our own further processing for our beef, pork, lamb, bison, and all of that. So we bring in that box product and combo trim and so forth from all of that from another plant and then we do all the further processing portion cutting grinding patties those types of things and producing hot dogs jerkies sausages and so forth again we market predominantly to restaurants and when you do that you've got to do things that are very appealing to them that's part of the marketing process and so what you see here are pictures of our showcases at various food shows. And again, these types of things are critically important because you've got to recognize who your target audience is and be able to market appropriately to them. Now, we're very transparent in our program, so every year in both the spring and the fall, we, harvest, we, we host multiple Farm Days tours. We call them our Farm Days events. And we do a lot of things with our visitors, our guests during those. One is we have receptions where they are able to sample many of our products, our protein and, and other products that we produce from our gardens and so forth at these receptions in, in, in the form of hors d'oeuvres. Then we host a dinner for them one of the evenings. Most of these events are two-day events. So that first evening we host a dinner. And again, everything that they eat on that table that evening, we produced on our farms. 100% of what they're consuming, we produced on the farm. And then we serve them lunches while we're out on the farms. Uh, and, and you see the center picture there. Yes, we do. We call that Couchon de Lay down south, but, uh, you know, whole pigs. And, uh, and we do a pig picking. And, and everybody is just fascinated by that. And then, of course, we take them out of the farms. And we take advantage of this. We don't just say, here's our pigs, here's our chickens, here's our cattle, 
you know, here are our fields or whatever, but we actually give our guests, these chefs, these distributors and consumers and so forth, we give them a mini lesson in soil health. So we're out there, we literally dig in the dirt and we show them what soil aggregates look like and, and we show them what health, healthy soil smells like and so forth and how to recognize it. And, and I will have to tell you, you know, my partners and I speak to farmers and ranchers literally all over the world and I'll have to tell you very straightforward that when we bring in these outside folks that don't have a direct connection with agriculture and we show them what soil health really means, do you know that they get it that quick? It resonates with them and yet many farmers and ranchers want to fight it, you know, and deny it. And oh, I don't know that I believe that, but, but you bring in chefs, you bring in consumers, you bring in distributors and so forth, and when they visually see this, it immediately re resonates. So that's very powerful. We, as farmers and ranchers folks, we have to do a lot more of that with the consumer because they hold the purse strings. That's what we have to understand. It's not your grain elevator, it's not your feedlot, it's not your packer. Those are the people we've been catering to, but the people we really need to cater to in agriculture are the people that buy our products and put them on their tables. They are the people that are going to influence change above and beyond anybody else. So that's why we do this. We have multiple enterprises. We're a big believer in the fact that we can produce multiple revenue streams from every acre every year. Why am I confined to producing a single revenue stream from a single acre? If I am, that is nobody else's fault but my fault. Why do I think that I can only grow corn on that acre this year? Or I can only grow soybeans? Or I can only produce a calf that I sell at weaning? We have far more things that we can do with every single acre on our farms. We are literally sitting, folks, on an incredible resource. If you own land, if you lease land, every acre is tremendous in what it can do. So we have timber, we have woodland grazing, silvopasture. We have organic vegetable gardens. We, have, we produce specialty and heritage crops, such as purple straw wheat, bloody butcher, and Hopi blue corn, Carolina gold rice, indigo, ginseng, mushrooms, turmeric, all of those types of things. We produce a specialty breed of cattle, and we have, we have a lot of black Angus, red Angus, and all of that in our, in our grass-fed program, but we also have a specialty breed called the Piney Woods. We produce seed stock Piney Woods, market those. We produce a lot of replacement heifers for sale. They're in high demand. If you have grass type replacement heifers, there's a huge demand for those type of cattle. We do recreational opportunities beyond our farm tours. So we offer hunting and fishing and agritourism opportunities and classes and workshops on the farm. And we'll be doing a Soil Health Academy in May there on one of our farms that is directly related to adaptive grazing, multi-species grazing, and marketing. So those, that's going to be the focus of that particular workshop. Some of the other things that we do, we offer internships. So we always have interns on our farms and at our meat company. And these include students, beginning farmer and rancher folks, farmer veterans, all of that. We have international interns and apprenticeships. We've got a couple coming over from South Africa here in a couple of months that'll be with us for the rest of the year. We also do an on-farm business incubator. We want to be able to give back and it's very important for us to be able to help revitalize our rural economies. So one of the programs that we started is sort of a shark tank type deal. And anybody that works for us on our farms, they can come to us with a business plan and they have to write it and they have to develop a pro forma, cash flow projections, all of that 
and what their capital needs are, but if they have a viable business idea that they can implement on our farms, then we consider that. And if we think it is a good idea, then we will give them the acres and we will provide the upfront capital for them to develop that with the hope that within three to five years they have built a business for themselves and have built enough equity and marketing savvy that they can leave us and start their own farm, start their own operation. So that's our farm business incubator. And again, I mentioned the farm days events and we have like a fall harvest party and spring on the farm and that type of thing. I want to show you a few quotes here, and then we're going to dive into adaptive stewardship. I really love this quote by Wendell Berry. Wendell says, agricultural choices must be made by these inescapable standards. The ecological health of the farm and the economic health of the farmer. And Masanabu has this wonderful quote, an object seen in isolation from the whole is not the real thing. Now he is sort of the Wendell Berry of Japan, okay? To give you an idea who this guy is. When I was in academia, and this is still occurring in academia, unfortunately what we spent a lot of time doing was viewing objects in isolation. And we were isolating ourselves from the whole. That has caused us, through a lot of our agronomic research, our academic research, and I'm not going to pull any punches in this. I've been there. I lived that world. Okay? But we must reorient ourselves in our academic research. We must quit looking at things that are just simply putting band-aids on a gushing wound that are addressing symptoms rather than root cause. We must think about research that is highly interdisciplinary and we're not having these little turf wars and everything else that so frequently occur at our academic institutions and instead we are truly trying to solve the real problems that we have and looking at them holistically. That's very important. Rick Warren, pastor out in California, the best leaders make the best decisions when they have the best information. Even if you're a good leader, if you don't have the best information, you will make a bad decision. And Sam Bass, a real good friend of mine, he's a farmer down in Oklahoma, and Sam's just sort of a very down-to-earth guy, former Navy guy, and he says, what if I could tell you something that would completely change the way you farm a ranch? And that is, there is a God and you're not Him. Okay? We've got to realize that. We've got to recognize that. We're not in control. Nature does always win. So how can we work with her rather than against her and trying to fight her? In the Norman words, but to live, we must daily break the body and shed the blood of creation. When we do this knowingly, lovingly, skillfully, and reverently, it's a sacrament. But when we do it ignorantly, greedily, clumsily, and destructively, it is a desecration. In such desecration, we condemn ourselves to spiritual and moral loneliness and others to want. So... Here's what it's all about for us. It's about the why. Why do we do what we do? So let me give you some resources to help you with that. And many of you in here are doing amazing things. I know that and I fully recognize that. And many of you are aware of these resources. But for those that you are not, these are outstanding resources. One is the Soil Carbon Cowboys film series. We started this back in... 2013, 2014, I think, with Peter Bick. He's the filmmaker. We have nine of these films out now. The latest one is now out on the SoilCarbonCowboys.com website, and it is called Herd Impact. It is a very powerful film. So watch them all if you haven't, but watch that latest one. It will blow your mind. Okay? 
It's called Herd Impact. Our Soil Health Academy website, we have a number of resources available for you there, and we're continuing to build that out. So as we go, we will continue to have more and more resources, resources on that website. And one of the things that we have started doing, and it's been met with, with uh, you know, really, really good positive feedback, and we do monthly Q&A sessions where anybody that's been through an academy can dial in and we, we go for two hours and they can dial in and we're, we're having people from all over the world dialing in. And we always do it in an evening and they can ask questions and we answer questions and anybody can have input. Additional resources. I've been working with uh, the Winrock Foundation on a project called the Pastor Project. And within this project, we have put together a lot of different resource materials that are very good. One of the things is we're doing ongoing farm trials on cover crops and grazing and adaptive grazing and those types of things. So all of that data and those findings and summaries are posted on the pastorproject.org website. We have decision calculators that are available for you there. We have webinars and numerous PowerPoint presentations. Most of what I'm presenting today is available on the pastorproject.org. And we just finished a 42 video series on how-to videos for adaptive grazing and cover crop utilization. So we've got that 42 video series. They're all short films averaging anywhere from about four minutes to 10 minutes. Grass-fed exchange is another very good resource. Every presentation that has ever been done over the last several years on our grass-fed exchange conferences is available to you on the grass-fed exchange website. We're also working heavily with an organization called Kiss the Ground. Uh, we have a new film out that was released oh, about four or five months ago called A Regenerative Secret. You can just Google that and you can easily pop that up, but it, it's a very good film. And then a very recent film with Farmer's Footprint that will be released in February, early February. And we actually have the stars of that film sitting in the room today, Grant and Dawn Breitkreutz. But this is, it's an outstanding film. It's going to be a series and there will be multiple episodes to this. And Dr. Zach Bush is, is one of the primary people that has put this together to look at things from a human and medical perspective. Now one of the things that I want you to understand when we talk about adaptive stewardship, why do we care? Why does it matter? It matters because nature is incredibly powerful and incredibly wonderful if we just take the time to notice. and If we'll take the time to understand how we can work integrally with her. So I want to ask this question, why as farmers and ranchers have we evolved into a way of farming and ranching that ignores the very thing that makes life subsist and thrive on this planet? And over the last several decades, we've done a good job of ignoring that. Take a look at this creature. It's called a sea sheep. It's actually a sea slug. But look at that. Look at that. How incredible is nature to be able to create creatures like that. This is another creature that is incredibly powerful in agriculture. And we're seeing less and less of them in a lot of farm fields. But, you know, I'm, I am seeing a huge return when we develop diversity and complexity. We start to see a lot more ladybugs appearing. What about a corn that acquires its own nitrogen? You know, this is a big area of research right now, the discovery, and, and this is not some kind of genetically engineered deal. Actually, this corn has existed for more than a thousand years. It's just a recent rediscovery. It's so old it's new, but a corn that can acquire its own nitrogen. Some other things, and why am I showing you this? Because it's important. We need to understand what's going on beneath our feet every day so that we can more fully understand how we need to manage what we're charged with managing every day. So 
this is a very recent discovery of phenomena chorizophagy. And what we have found is it's the ability of plants to be able to take in soil bacteria that exist around their roots. In other words, the plant roots act almost as a vacuum and they suck in this bacteria. And bacteria, soil bacteria, what's one of their major functions? Is to consume nutrients as they leach down through the soil through rainfall and all of that to keep them from leaching out of the, the reach of the plant roots. So then those nutrients are contained within the cellular membrane of the bacteria, but the bacteria is not a time-release capsule. So something has to happen to break down that cellular membrane to allow those nutrients to be released for plant uptake. And this is one of the things that happens. Bacteria being eaten by protozoa is another. But this rhizophagy, so they suck in the bacteria internal to the root endo, and then powerful root enzymes dissolve that membrane. It releases those nutrients. The plant can take them up and use them. And then guess what happens? They spit the membraneless bacteria back out into the soil and they reform a membrane and repeat this process all over again. How powerful a system is that? Pretty darn incredible. That's a picture of this occurring. So that's a Phragmites root and, you, and, and it's in the process of absorbing these soil bacteria. I love this quote by Dr. Christine Jones, when we're standing on soil, we're standing on the rooftop of another world. This is another incredibly powerful and wondrous microorganism, mycorrhizal fungi. And it seems like we just continue to discover all of the different things that mycorrhizal fungi do for us. You know, but these are tiny filamentous organisms that attach themselves to plant roots. So let's talk about what they do. First of all, they're far, far better at picking up and absorbing nutrients, minerals in the soil than the plant roots themselves and then transfer them to the plant roots. They solubilize bound nutrients. They produce enzymes. They're like expert miners. And they can solubilize bound nutrients in the soil, even in solid rock, and make those minerals available for plant uptake. They extend the reach of the plant roots themselves many times beyond the roots. And they significantly increase the absorptive surface area of the plant roots from hundreds to thousands of times. So they greatly extend the reach of plant roots. They interconnect plant roots. So if we have diversity in the field, then they interconnect all of that diverse array of plants and feed nutrients and transfer nutrients from one to the other to the other. And they not only transfer those primary nutrients that we think about, but also those secondary nutrients. We call them secondary metabolites. And Dr. Fred Provenza, uh, that I'll talk about here in just a minute a little more, has done a lot of the seminal research in this area. Mycorrhizal fungi also can transfer organic nitrogen in the form of amino acids to plant roots. So it's another way for nitrogen to be fed from the soil into the plants. And they mobilize many different minerals and feed them. They preserve and supply water to plants in periods of drought. Did you know that? If you have an extensive mycorrhizal system underneath the soil, you are far more drought resilient, and that's beyond just the biotic glues that they produce to aggregate the soil. They also transfer water molecules into the plant roots that are stored there for periods of drought, a water reserve, so to speak, that won't exist without the mycorrhizal association. They are also nature's principal immune system against fungal root disease. What's happened with the incidence of fungicide applications over the last two decades? Has it increased or decreased? We're applying a lot more fungicides, aren't we? Well, why? We have neglected the principal immune system for our plants. If we reestablish these very powerful mycorrhizal associations, our plants now have a lot more immunity conferred upon them from disease and pest. 
This is a picture of mycorrhizal fungi um, transfer amino acids. Picture where you see basically the pink or red color. And then this is a picture of mycorrhizal fungi putting water molecules into the root of a plant. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the three core principles of adaptive stewardship. These apply no matter where you are in the world, no matter your soil type, no matter what you grow, and no matter your climate. None of that matters. What matters is the application and understanding of these three principles. And they are the principle of compounding, the principle of diversity, and the principle of disruption. So the first thing we have to remember in the principle of compounding is that nothing is ever singular in nature. Nothing. If we apply any synthetic fertilizer, any chemical, it never produces a singular effect. It always results in a series of compounding and cascading effects. And these effects are never neutral. They're either positive or negative. We, as managers of the land, are the determiners of whether this is, it's going to be a positive or negative effect. That's up to us in how we manage our land. So everything that we do creates this whole series of compounding, cascading events. And if we start asking ourselves that, okay, if I apply this or I implement this practice or I do this type of tillage or whatever, not just as what that what is that going to do immediately? But what is that going to create in terms of ripple effects down the road for me? Is it going to be positive? Or is it going to be negative? And how do I deal with that? It also creates epigenetic effects. And that's a whole other topic, so I won't dive into that today. Second principle, principle of diversity. We want highly diverse and complex pastures and annual mixes, not monocultures. Not monocultures. We have become a monoculture society, and yet that has led to the severe and tremendous degradation of our soil and to the myriad problems, disease and pest issues that we have not just with our plants, but also with our livestock. So we created those problems by creating this vast system of monoculture. So we've got to reintroduce diversity into our farms and ranches. And we've got to consider the three primary functional plant groups for, that, for a field system. And those are grasses, legumes, and forbs. So diversity is key. We absolutely want diversity, and what we find is that when we can foster this and facilitate and create this, then our systems start to thrive, and they start to really work in close harmony with nature and with what we're doing. So why do we want complexity and diversity? Well, we want it because it creates positive compounding and cascading effects. That first principle, the number one principle. Secondly, Different plants produce different secondary and tertiary compounds, nutritive compounds, that are highly medicinal in nature, both to other plants and to livestock and wildlife. And many of them produce antiparasitic compounds that if we have diversity for our livestock to forage on, they are literally deworming themselves in the process of doing that if we have diversity. That's the work of Dr. Fred Provenza. Fred just has a brand new book out called Nourishment, and we're actually going to do a series of workshops with Fred uh, relative to that. But read that book if you haven't yet. It's, again, it's called Nourishment. But he talks a lot about this and relating it to human health and nutrition and so forth. Diversity in our plant species also creates diversity in microbial species beneath the soil surface. It creates diversity in the macroorganisms that exist above the soil and in the soil, and it produces exponential rather than linear impact. So we should have 
legumes, forbs, and grasses present in our pastures on our rangeland in warm season annuals and cool season annuals. We work a lot with grazing dairies and grass-fed dairies, and this is just a simple example of some of the diversity that we encourage and develop in their perennial pastures for our grass-fed dairies. You'll notice some things in there that you may say, well, that's a weed. Folks, there is no such thing as an objective definition of a weed. It doesn't exist. Any definition of a weed is purely subjective, and I'm going to submit to you that every plant that's growing there, whether you like it or not, is growing there for a purpose, and it's growing there to heal something that we caused, a scab on the soil that we caused. That's why it's there. They're not growing there to aggravate us and to confound us. They're growing there to heal something. Principle of disruption, the third principle. Nature has tremendous resilience and responds well to challenges. So we need to be able to introduce planned, purposeful disruptions. One of the things, and this is just sheer human nature, but one of the things that we like to do is we like to have a recipe, a formula, a system. And once we settle into that, we want to do the same thing every time, every year, year in and year out. Well, this particular cover crop mix worked real well for me, so I'm going to use that mix every time. Or, you know, last year I did this type of tillage, and boy, it just seemed to really work, so now that's what I'm going to do all the time, year in and year out. Or I planted this variety of corn, and it worked well last year, so I'm going to plant that variety from now on. But somehow all of that never quite works as good the next time and the next time and the next time, does it? And you wonder why. Well, the reason it doesn't is because you're doing the same thing. You just stagnated nature. Think about it. Uh, I like to use this analogy of an elite athlete. You know, we're biology, aren't we? Our bodies are biology. Nature is biology. So we all respond the same to external challenges and stressors. An elite athlete, to become an elite athlete, what did they have to do? Did they do the same exercise routine at the same intensity year in and year out? No. They had to constantly change their exercise routine, duration, intensity, to constantly challenge their muscles and their mind so that they could grow, they could get bigger, faster, stronger, have greater endurance. You never develop that doing the same routine over and over every day. Well, if our bodies respond that way and we get better with challenges, with stressors, why do we think nature does not? Nature does. Nature responds very well to planned, purposeful disruptions. Challenges that allow her to build her resilience, to build her diversity, to build her ability to be able to make it through very stressful periods. So this in and of itself, these planned purposeful disruptions create a whole series of positive compounding effects. So as you notice here, the principle of compounding it's the first principle, but the principle of diversity and the principle of disruption all contribute and build the principle of compounding. So flexibility is the key here, okay? Don't do things the same way every time. Adaptive management is not a rigid routine. Now, this is just a very short list. There's many, many more things you can do, but what are some of the things you can do to be disruptive in, in crops, okay? Rotate your crop species cultivars, and no corn and beans is not a rotation. Okay? Corn and beans and corn and beans is not a valid rotation. You've got to be much more creative than that. All right? Livestock row crop rotations. We're doing more and more of this all over the country. Reduce, reduce, reduce tillage in that disturbance. Rotate your cover crop mixes. Okay? Do not plant the same mix day in and day out, time in and time out. Introduce things like roll down. Uh, great, if you're grazing, how can you be disruptive in your grazing? Alter stock densities. 
And we've got a whole series of videos that talk about these types of things that you can watch on pastorproject.org. And we talk about it in the Soil Carbon Cowboy series. But alter stock densities. Don't move through the rotations in the same pattern year in and year out. If you start in pasture A and then go B, C, D, and E every year, change that this coming spring. Start in D, not in A. You'd be amazed what a profound difference that makes. Alter grazing heights on and off from time to time. Alter your rest periods. If you do multi-species like we do, alter species order as they're moving through your paddocks. And then alter the time of season or year that you're grazing a particular paddock or pasture. So what is the best tool in your toolbox? Observation. As farmers and ranchers, we have gotten to the point that we spend way too much time with our butt planted in the seat of something. A truck, a UTV, a tractor, a combine, a sprayer, or in a chair doing this, right? Or doing this. We're not a whole lot better than our kids and grandkids, are we? With all of these types of devices. We're not doing enough observation of the world around us. That we need to pay attention. And use all your senses that God gave us. Use your sense of sight, of sound, of smell, of touch, and even taste. I taste things while I'm out there. I taste the plants. Taste the soil. You would be amazed at what you can learn by using your senses. And the one thing that we have found is that when we renew our powers of observation on our farms and ranches, then we start to develop our intuition. And intuitively, our decision-making on a day-in, day-out basis becomes far better. Because now we're relating things to each other. We're understanding the why. We're understanding the whole, the entirety, the holistic system that exists in front of us. And now we're able to make decisions that are, that are far, far better. So adaptive grazing, for instance, it allows a practitioner to develop multiple goals or address multiple goals and objectives. It's not a rigid routine or practice and neither should it be. And it allows us to constantly adapt to changing conditions. You know, down where we farm and ranch in Mississippi and Alabama, you would be amazed, you know, over the last 20 years, we have clearly developed into a, a pattern of a dry season and a wet season. Our winters in early springs are very, very wet, as I mentioned to you earlier. And then our summers can get exceedingly dry if we don't have tropical activity to interrupt that all the way through the fall. So we have a wet season and a dry season. But do you know that our farmers and ranchers haven't adapted to that? They haven't adjusted to that? They still think, oh no, this summer it's not going to get dry. And I'm going to have grass to last through the summer and into the fall. And then they find themselves inevitably feeding hay by August and September in Mississippi. Okay? In Mississippi. Feeding hay by August and September because they've already run out of grass because it was too dry. And they, they don't pre-plan for the wet, muddy conditions in the winter and stockpile and create areas that'll hold cattle up in the winter, and so they create these enormous mud bogs. I mean, I can show you mud bog after mud bog down there right now with cattle belly deep in mud in the deep south, in the deep south. And guess what? You deal with that a relatively short period of time up here in your spring thaw. Down there, if you don't do things right, you deal with it from December through April, mud. It's not pleasant. So we're trying to recreate and restore the carbon cycle. It's goal-oriented, predicated on stock density, not stocking rate. Management and flexibility are key, as are frequent movement and rest. We pay close attention to plant root system recovery. And in many parts of the world, it's highly reliant on temporary fencing technology. 
but done right, it produces very positive compounding and cascading effects. All we're trying to do is simulate nature. That's it. And recreate what nature used to do for us here and the tremendous fertility that the wild ruminants once created in North America. These are recent pictures of, uh, in, in Africa. And they show you know, what's still occurring in some part. Unfortunately, this is diminishing tremendously in Africa, but we still have some massive herds that are still able to create some fertility in the soil. So we're creating my, biomimicry and ecomimicry, and we're just translating that from the plains and the Serengeti and all of that to our pastures, to our fields. This is a flock of sheep, okay, doing the same thing with sheep, creating incredible density and diversity and impact on the land. Uh, this is holding sheep, even our sheep we contain under a single strand of polywire. You don't need fancy systems and setups and multi strands and net wire and all of these other things. You can train any species to work and, re and respond well under a single strand of electrified polywire. And so what we have found is this, as we move along the continuum on our grazing, from continuous grazing to adaptive grazing, we get a myriad of benefits. We get significant benefits from heightened fertility, from far more even manure and urine distribution across every acre versus it being concentrated as it is with continuous grazing and slow rotations around your water and shade. We also move along the continuum of diversity and soil health and root depth and mass. And we work a lot with Audubon and what we have found is that we've been able to significantly improve and increase bird populations because of this. Same thing with cover crops, grazing cover crops in between our cash crops. As we move along this continuum, we're able with better grazing, with adaptive stewardship practices, we're better able to elicit the type of response that we want. So I'm gonna finish up this morning with a couple examples of adaptive stewardship in practice in real life. And I'm gonna show you a couple of extreme circumstances. Earlier I talked about nature is resilient. And I said nature has the ability to be able to respond brilliantly to challenges. I'm going to show you how she does that. Okay. This first farm, North Carolina, Adam Grady, one of our clients. Adam's only been practicing regenerative farming and ranching for just 2018, was just his second year. They're multi-generational. The farm's been in their family since the 1880s. Four generations farming on that land today, alive and farming. But up until two years ago, they were doing everything very conventionally. High tillage, high synthetic use, conventional grazing, on and on. So it's called Dark Branch Farm. So for the last two years, no-till, cover crops, livestock integration, planting non-GMO instead of GMO crops. They, had, they didn't use any glyphosate at all or any other uh, herbicide in 2018. They were able to totally remove themselves from that in 2018. They planted everything into a standing cover crop that was rolled down. Uh, his absolute next door neighbor, and the reason I'm bringing this up, it's important, uh, they, did, they tried no-till for the first time in 2018, but they've been very high cultivation prior, but they're still highly dependent on synthetic inputs, chemical inputs, all of that no cover crop or livestock integration. So this is what Adam does. Adam raises grass-fed beef and pastured pork. So he's got them all integrated heavily on the pasture. He does roll down. So he goes in and rolls down his cover crops, plants into the standing roll down. And this year, in 2018, this is what happened, or last year, 2018, this is what happened. So he and his next door neighbor, immediate next door neighbor, the very first week in April planted their corn. They were planting the exact same days side by side. You can see the difference. This picture was taken May 29th, May 29th. Okay, so approximately two months after the corn was planted. Adam's corn, immediately next door, the next door field, his neighbor's corn. 
Adam ended up yielding 189 bushels per acre dry land corn with no inputs, by the way, okay. And his neighbor yielded 134 bushels. His neighbor had to replant. He had a failure on the first plant and had to replant. That's why it looked, but what do you notice in his neighbor's field? Water, standing water, right? There was none in Adam's field immediately next door because Adam had far greater aggregate, aggregation and water infiltration rates just immediately next door, a few feet away. Now here's the challenge. Here's where we discovered that even after just two years, nature's resilient showing herself. Hurricane Florence with the same power and fury as Hurricane Harvey the year earlier that hit Texas. Hurricane Florence hit and dumped 35 plus inches of rain on Adam and all of his neighbors just kept churning and churning. So this is September the 13th when Florence is just making landfall. Okay? September the 13th and this is Adam rigging up. His power had already gone out in his house. This is not legal, but this is how he powered his house. Okay, so uh, this is the morning of September the 14th. You can see flooding is already occurring. Okay, that's some of his farm buildings in the background. This is the afternoon of the same day. So from that morning to that afternoon, by that afternoon, he had eight to nine foot of water across his farm. You only see the eaves. These are old turkey houses that have been repurposed, and you only see the eaves of those present. That white building there is floating, okay? It's no longer attached to its foundation. It's floating in the floodwaters. This is the morning of September 15th. By the way, every one of these pictures was taken from a boat. That was the only way he could get around on his farm. The morning of September the 15th, you can see the floodwaters are still pretty high. And again, you can see what it looked like there. Uh, his father's house is that red roof house that you see there. They just barely, barely avoided completely flooding their house. By September the 16th, the flood waters had started to uh, subside a little bit. You can see they're going down. That's a church that's on the edge of their property. Unfortunately, that church building hat was completely condemned and has to be torn down now. By the morning of the 17th, you can see the waters have subsided a little more. By the 19th, still some water covering the ground, but he can now get around on a tractor rather than the boat. To show you what happened, he was able, luckily, to harvest all of his corn ahead of the hurricane getting in, but the soybeans weren't ready. So this is his seven-year-old son standing, not kneeling, in his soybeans, August the 30th, Immediately following the flood, that's what all the soybeans look like. That's what eight to nine foot of water will do for you. So it killed them all. This is what his summer annuals look like. You can see the ears and heads of cattle in there grazing, so that's how tall it was. And he was stockpiling a lot of this for fall and winter grazing. That's what that stockpile looked like immediately following the flood. So what do you do? When something like that happens and everything that you have there for your livestock to eat is all of a sudden gone, every bit of it, nothing is there anymore. Well, this is what it looked like just one month after the flood. And let me tell you what happened. Two weeks after the flood water subsided, in just two years, he built aggregate to, to such an extent and he had built his biology to such an extent that it had this tremendous infiltration capacity. Two weeks after the flood water subsided, he was able to get on there with his tractors and no-till planter and replant. Just two weeks. His neighbors couldn't even begin to think about that. They would have sunk their tractors or combines to the axle in their fields. So their fields held them up. They were able to get in and plant. This, these pictures are two weeks after planting. The incredible response of those complex cover crop mixes that were planted following that flood event was absolutely phenomenal. And he's long been back grazing in spite of that. All of his neighbors are still brown, still feeding hay, still supplementing. He's actively grazing. There are eastern North Carolina very sandy soils. Look at what he's built. 
Look at what he's added on top of that sand in just two years. Pretty powerful. So the last thing I want to show you, and I'll run through this very quickly, what about a very fragile environment? Now, North Carolina's not a fragile environment, but it was subjected to an incredible force of nature. And you see how resilient the other nature responded. But what about the Chihuahuan Desert of Mexico? So we're doing a lot of work down there, and we'll be teaching another academy down there next month in February. They get less than eight inches of rain annually, a true desert. Temperatures can soar to 105 degrees or more. Most ranches down there require 300 plus acres per cow. Wrap your mind around that. 300 plus acres per cow, but with adaptive stewardship, they are, these guys are now greening the desert. And, and we've got a team of them that's going to be presenting at the grass-fed exchange. And I'm very, in California coming up in April, I'm very excited for our audience to hear these guys and to hear their story because it's, it's absolutely fantastic. This is what the Chihuahuan Desert looks like under conventional management, conventional ranching management. Now do you understand why it takes 300 acres to support a cow? They gotta walk a long way between bites, okay? But that's what it looks like. And you see that, what looks like a dry riverbed there? That's not a dry riverbed, that's erosion caused by less than eight inches of rain. Did you know that you can have significant erosion with very low rainfall? Absolutely you can. And let me show you even more significant erosion with less than eight inches of rain a year. That's not a natural canyon. That is erosion. You see the bottom middle picture, the old fence suspended in midair? That's where the soil used to be. But before it eroded and created this canyon. I, and that's some of our, our, our regenerative ranchers that you see standing there that were showing us this. And I asked them if they were trying to compete with us with our Grand Canyon. Uh, they were building a new Grand Canyon down there. But, uh, so can the desert be transformed? What can we do about that? Or is it hopeless? Let's take a look. Las Damas Ranch, and there's many others that we can show you, but I'm going to use the Las Damas this morning. Look at this. That's that exact same desert. Doesn't appear to be, does it? You now see a sea of grass before you and thriving mesquite and all of that. Just look back very briefly. No grass. And the mesquite in the background is spindly, low-growing, struggling. But look here, big mesquite, okay, thriving, thriving, full of life, grass everywhere, in the middle of this exact same desert. Look at the abundance that's been created. Where did it come from? It came from the latent seed bank. These are vast remote ranches. There's no irrigation. They're not going to plant anything. They don't fertilize anything. How was this created? Simply by the way they managed their livestock, their fences, their water. And when I say water, water for their livestock to drink, not to irrigate. None of this was irrigated or is irrigated now. Okay? So all of this came from the response from the latent seed mine. So what's the result? They've reduced acres required per cow from 300 plus to now only requiring about 30 to 40 acres per cow year round. A tenfold increase. They just gain free acres. Free acres. They don't have to pay any more taxes. They didn't buy any more acres, no more insurance, nothing. Free acres. They're producing significantly more pounds of beef per acre. Their net profits have increased more than three times already. So absolutely phenomenal. We're doing the same thing in New Mexico. This is a Rani Ranch in New Mexico. And we're getting, th this was back in November, uh, getting very similar results. That sort of white bushy type stuff you see growing there is called winter fat. And when the original settlers moved into that region, that was a very important forage for them in the winter. And then it was just so overgrazed in that country that it killed a lot of that out. But now all the winter fat is coming back, and they didn't plant it. The Rannies didn't plant it, 
it's coming back from the latent seed bank. The seed is still there. And that's what we're finding globally, not just here in the U.S., but globally. There's a thriving seed bank that's available for us if we'll just find it. So I'm going to leave you with that. Think about those are two extreme conditions. They clearly show the power, the resilience of nature, the ability of nature to be able to take those challenges and to be able to produce something profoundly positive that benefits everybody. So thank you. I tremendously appreciate the opportunity to be here. Again, I'll be here all day and looking forward to, to talking with each of you. So thank you very much.